So let's go through um, and update Bloodhound here. So I'm going to open up Bloodhound. And let's see. I'm going to now, hmm, it was asking me to update. Maybe I canceled, <laughs> I think I canceled the update too many times this morning. So anyway, so I'm going to have to do a manual check for an update here. And so there we go. All right, so I have a, a pre-release 1.2 on, on my system here. Um, and now Jeremy's pushed out um, an actual release. So it's a little newer. All right, so um, so if you want want to make sure that Bloodhound keeps checking for updates, um, you know, make sure that this auto check updates is is checked. So, all right, so I'll hit yes there, and you'll see it's going to open up my web browser, and I have Chrome set as my default web browser for this VMware, and you'll see that. For Chrome, it automatically is downloading the update right there. So what I need to do is shut down NinjaTrader. So close up shop, and then I'm going to open up my control panel. And um, for most of you guys, your control panel is going to be from your start button and then go to control panel right here. But since I'm do some testing once in a while, I, I put the control panel on my uh, desktop for convenience. All right, so when the control panel is open, you want to go to programs. And there's our list of programs. And I need to uninstall the uh, Shark and Kidder's Bloodhound. And eventually, you know, eventually we'll find a better installation program that will automatically uninstall it for you and then install the new version. Um, but for now, we'll have to manually uninstall Bloodhound. All right, so I can close that up. And now in my web browser here, I can click on this and that runs the installer so I'm going to run it and check the uh, I agree button hit next and uh, so you'll notice that there are some check boxes here so if you don't want the bar types installed on your system you can uncheck that and it will not install the bar types and if you don't want the samples templates then you can uninstall those as well and these sample templates let me show you those will just show up in Bloodhound. But what it does is I am opening up right my NinjaTrader 7 folder. And if I go into templates, let me sort these by, by alphabetical. There we go. So I'm going to go into my templates and go into Bloodhound. And let's see. Oh. So I guess I have not I have not been installing the templates, but anyways, it, it puts a, a templates folder in here and inside that there's the um, those example sample systems uh, as kind of a training tool with Bloodhound. So that's where they're gonna go. They're gonna go get dumped in here and that way Bloodhound will uh, be able to read them. So I'm just gonna check all these because most people don't even look at that they just blow through the next box here and just keep on going and all right so that's finished and then of course it uh, you know for new people it opens up your web browser to the uh, getting started page here with the training material on it all right so there's kind of the uh, training material to go through. So let's um, I'll just close out of my web browser and we are finished now.
And I also forgot to mention last week, right? What was it? Last week, NinjaTrader had pushed out uh, an update, release 16. And I wanted to mention last week that I did not have any troubles with the update. So I did actually update my VMware last week on NinjaTrader. So I'm getting a little sidetracked, but you can see I am up. I am up running NinjaTrader release 16. So uh, I updated a couple of my VMwares, and they updated without any problems at all. All right. So um, and um, so there we go. We're done with the update. Um, so now if I open up Bloodhound here and I do another manual check. There we go. Now it says I'm up to date. All right. Well, let me um, let me look at this question here from Julie just before I get started on building today's system. All right. So Julie's asking. I have a template that automatically loads when I start up Bloodhound. How do I change that so it doesn't happen? Okay. Yeah, so what you can do is this is a NinjaTrader function, right? So if you go into your indicators, and you probably know that, say like with the, the EMA, I can go in here, right, and I can uh, make some changes to this, and let me just apply it, right? So I made my EMA red and nice and fat, and if I right-click, you guys are probably familiar with the set default. So every time I call the EMA onto my chart, so every time I put a new EMA, it's going to default to this nice fat line here. So but I'm going to set it back. So you can do the same thing. So that's that's universal across all indicators, right? So I can do the same thing for the MACD. Um, and so the same thing with Bloodhound. So if I right click on Bloodhound and set default, well then Bloodhound is going to load this template file that I already have loaded here every single time that you add Bloodhound onto your chart. Um, so what you want to do is if you don't want Bloodhound to keep loading this template file every single time you add it onto your chart, you know, because you set this default, and what the way you fix that is let's go to our you want to go to your ninja trader 7 folder and so we're going to go back into the templates folder and this time you want to go into indicators right cuz we were just in the indicator dialog window so if we go into indicators we can see these are all the indicators that I have created a, a set default from right clicking right on that dialog box that I just showed you. Um, right, so there's the EMA one that I just made right in front of you guys. So I just need to come down here and um, find Bloodhound. Um, let's see. Oh, that's right. I don't have a Bloodhound one. Okay, so here. Let me make one real quick. I'll just open up my indicator window. There's Bloodhound, and boom, I'll just create a set of default there. Close that back up. And now there should be a, so there we go. So now I just created a SI Bloodhound um, default setting. So all I need to do is just delete it and, and now Bloodhound will not load that template file. So, um, all right, Julie, that's how you fix that one. So, also, um, it's a good thing that Julie brought this up. So, when, when, whenever an indicator gets updated, if you have these set defaults here and you're, and you get an updated indicator and it has one of these set defaults, um, if the updated indicator 
such as you know such as our bloodhound you know our bloodhound we're updating stuff all the time so if you get an update to your indicator and you have one of these what will happen is you will get an XML error message so you go to add your updated indicator on your chart and your trader throws up this XML error message um, and that is caused by this default by, the, by this default template file here. So if you update any of your indicators and you're starting to get that XML error message, the way to fix it is you just go in here and delete the file, you know, delete this file of your updated indicator. And that will get rid of that XML error message. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. Um, yep, no more questions. All right. So here's um, here was Jennifer's question. So I kind of worked with um, kind of built built uh, a part of it here real quick, just so we had, I'd have some signals on the on the chart for you guys to look at so here's the description for the long side and the short signals are just going to be the opposite so we want a long signal on the first bar so that tells me that we want a long signal just one one signal a signal once when the MACD crosses above the 0.02 level so I put um, I put little lines on my MACD, right? So the dashed white grayish lines are, you can see they're at the uh, negative 0.02 and positive 0.02 levels here, just so we can visually see when the MACD crosses those levels, right? And also part of the condition is the 20 EMA has to be sloping up. And so the red, line up here is our 20 EMA and so we can see the 20 EMA is also sloping up and then so the short signals are just the opposite so when the MACD crosses down um, below the negative 0 0.02 and the EMA is sloping down we want a short signal now that part's simple so now the additional requirement is that we don't want any more long signals right until the MACD crosses below our negative 0.2 um, threshold level so the MACD so for this long signal essentially we don't want any more long signals along here until the MACD crosses below our negative 0.02 area here so I kind of I marked some signals that we don't want to occur, right? So we got our our first short signal here. So this is valid. Then we see the MACD came up just enough to cross down below the negative 0.02, but we don't want this secondary signal because the MACD needs to cross up above the positive 0.02 area before we can go short again. So we want to eliminate the secondary short signal. And the same with this long signal. So we have got our first long signal over here. Let me open up the chart a little bit. So we got our first long signal over here, and then we got a secondary long signal. And we don't want the secondary long signal until the MACD crosses down below the negative 0.02 threshold level. And so here's just another third example. So we want to get rid of the secondary um, short signal. All right, so let me uh, get that out of the way. And yeah, I'll get this out of the way too. And we'll start building this from scratch. All right, so what I'm going to do, on here's another question that, that came in. 
um, the other day as well. And that is, you know, what exactly does this clear um, menu function do? So I'm going to hit it. And here's the confusion. And we're going to change this message. So this person brought up a good point. It says, you know, are you sure you want to clear all data? So they're asking, what do they mean all data? Well, yeah, actually what it means is, do you want to erase everything in your Bloodhound template? That's really what it does. That's what it's asking. And so we're going to change this so it's a little clearer and more direct to the point. So I'm going to hit yes. And you can see it erased all of my solvers. And it would have erased all of my logic templates as well. And you can see the name is even gone. So it even removed the name. So basically we're back to a brand new state uh, where Bloodhounds have been completely cleared out of everything. So to get started, I'm going to create a name first, give my system a name. So let me just find last week's, put today's date on there, there we go. Okay. Well, let me bring this back up here. So let's start. Um, with our first main condition, which is, right, we're, we're looking for the MACD to cross above the 0 0.02 or cross below the negative 0 0.02. So we're going to use a crossover solver. Add that on there. Change the name on here. And then switch my Mac, switch the indicator A over to the Mac D. And um, Jennifer, I don't, you didn't mention what your settings are for the Mac D, so I'm just using the, the standard periods here on the Mac D, and it seems to work well. And um, and the Mac D line is already defaulted as being checked, used for the long and the short signals. So we're good there. And now the indicator B. So this, we're looking for the MACD line, right? So we're looking for a blue MACD line to be crossing a threshold level, or another term would be an absolute level or an absolute value, right? So that's a fixed, fixed value or an absolute value. So I'm going to put it on, put the type on an absolute value. And then I can punch in 0 0.02. And there we go. So now we, you can see we get some crossover signals. Now we can see that we're getting a, a short signal here when the MACD is crossing below the positive 0.2. I'm going to stretch this out here. All right, so we're getting a short signal that's crossing below the positive 0 0.02 and we don't want short signals there. We only want long signals when the MACD is crossing up above it. So what I'm going to do is I can change the evaluate. Right now it's on both. And I'm going to change it to longs only. So now the solver is only going to give us long signals when the MACD is crossing up above. So knowing that, I should probably change the name. So I'll just put a little L in there for, for long. So this guy's ready to go. And as a shortcut, I'm just going to copy this, make a copy. And I'm going to turn the first one off. So that way, all I see is the signals coming from this, this copy that I just made. And I'll set this copy up so that it is looking for our short signals. So I need to change this now to short only. All right, so now we can see it's only given us short signals, but it's at the wrong um, threshold value. So I just need to change my absolute value to a negative. 
and there we go. So now it's giving us a short signal in the right location. Now if I turn these both on, you'll see that, right, remember I'm working on the solver tab. So with both of these turned on, you can see that I'm not, I, I, I get an output from Bloodhound, but I don't get any trade signals, right? These, you can see these out, output values are at 0.5 and 0.5. So that's why I like to just check one, have one checked at a time if I'm building a solver on the solver tab. So now with only one turned on, you can see it's giving me a full signal. So if I turn two solvers on, what happens is both of these solvers have to be a have to give you an output at the same time, right, on the same bar in order to get a full signal. But that will never occur because one solver is only given is only give, giving us longs and the other solver is only giving us shorts. So we'll never get a, a signal uh, working on the solver tab. So we're going to have to switch over to the logic tab now. And I'll just give that a name. And let me let me make my workspace a little bigger. So I'm going to put those existing nodes that I already created. So the existing nodes here, I'm going to drop those on the workspace. Drop both of them on here. And put them off to the side. And so what I'm going to do, and if I wanted to, I could just plug them in real quick and test them. Right? So I can see this guy's working good. I can plug this one into the result node, test it, and I can see it's working good. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to join them together <clears throat> with the OR node, and that kind of makes them, joins them together into one solver in a sense. So it takes the output from both of these solvers, joins them together into one, one output. So now if I look at my chart, now I get the signals from both solvers joined together and now you can see it's painting, right, it's putting the racing stripes on the chart. So it's painting, shading the whole chart now with a full signal. And so now you can see the output here is at 1. So if we look on our, the scaling on our chart over here, we can see the output is at 1 now. Whereas when we were on the solver tab, it was only 0.5. Okay, so we're kind of done with the, I guess, kind of the core part of the signal. And so the next step is to add in this other criteria, the 20 EMA um, sloping in, this, in the correct direction, in the same direction. So now that I have started working on a logic board here. Um, what I can do now is if I need to create a new solver, I can just drop down a new solver here. So I'll add a new slope solver and I'm just going to plug it straight into the result node so I can see exactly what how what this solver is doing, make sure it's working correctly for me. And I need to switch this over to the EMA 20. And the EMA only has one plot, so we don't have to worry about changing our plots. That's good to go. And simply, we're just looking for the EMA to either be sloping up or sloping down, right, to meet our criteria. We're not worried about any kind of a minimum slope requirement for our system. So we can just leave um, the parameters here alone, and the outputs are already set correctly by default for what we're looking for. So simply enough, when we look at our chart, when the EMA is sloping up, we want a long signal. 
And when the EMA is sloping down, we're looking for a short output from Bloodhound. All right, so now we need to tie these two um, conditions together. So let me slide these back a little bit. And since they both have to be in agreement, I'm going to use the AND node. Plug that in there. And connect that up. And so now we're back to where we were at the very beginning of the workshop with our with all the core signals. And now we can start working on blocking these secondary signals that we don't want. So we're going to block that one. We'll block the second long signal and the second short signal. So what we're going to use is, since we want to block a signal, we're going to use the signal blocker. So let me move this again. And I'm going to make some room for the signal blocker. So I'm going to just connect that in like that. Put it in there. And now, now we'll work on setting up uh, setting up the requirements that reset our signal blocker. Um, so I'm going to start by yeah I'm going to start by turning off all of these uh, reset parameters here, and um, I definitely want to block more than five bars. So I'm going to, let's just kind of, let me look through the chart here and kind of take a guess. You know, that that's a pretty length, lengthy gap between this long signal and this one. Um, so let's see if, well, I'll just put 200 bars in there. That'll definitely block and so we can see it's blocking a lot of signals here. Too many signals. So the way I have this function node set up right now is it is just basically blocking for 200 bars. And then it will reset itself and allow the next signal to come through. Um, you know, so this is just kind of a, a dummy state right now. A real simple state. Right, so... We have this long signal here. Then I have to scroll forward and wait for 200 bars to go by until the next signal can appear. So what we need to do is start setting up some of these other uh, parameters or some of these other conditions that will reset the signal blocker. Um, so we're not just waiting for 200 bars. We want, we want to reset the signal blocker Essentially, let me scroll back here. So when, when this long signal occurs, we want to reset the signal blocker when we get our next short signal here. And so that is going to be our input opposite signal. All right, so as soon as I turn that on, you see that this short signal here showed up. So let me explain what the title of this parameter means. So it says input opposite signal. So input here is referring that I need to zoom in to this node. All right, so you can see we have it. We have an input node here um, and we have a reset little connector actually I guess I should call this a connector instead of a node um, so we have a our signal blocker node and then we have this input connector and a reset connector and so the title so this input here 
in the parameter name is referring to this connector. And you'll see some of these others say reset. Right? So if I start at the top, we have an input one here, an input one here, and a reset one, and another reset one. So this reset is referring to this connector here at the reset. Um, so we're using the input connector and we're looking for an opposite signal coming into the input connector. And that is, so that opposite signal is what's resetting the functionality of this whole signal blocker node. So, um, so what happened here is, right, we have a valid short signal coming in, and now the signal blocker starts blocking our signals until an opposite signal comes in. Uh, which would be, right, so if we're, if we're starting with the short signal, um, we need an opposite signal, which would be our long signal here, to come in and reset the function node. So this signal blocker is going to block the signals for, for 200 bars. Oops, let me bring this back, sorry. So it's going to block all the signals for 200 bars or until we get an opposite signal coming in to the input. So now, so it's blocking signals. So it blocked this other, remember there used to be another short signal here. So it's blocking this one. And it's going to keep blocking for 200 bars. But what happened was an opposite signal, this long signal, the opposite signal came in. It came into the input connector. And so it reset the signal blocker and allowed this long signal to come through. And so now it's going to be blocking for another 200 bars until an opposite signal comes in. So an opposite of a long signal here would be a short signal. So here, let me show you a little trick in working with this guy. So here's a little trick that I like to do when I'm working with it is you can see right here we do have an output section that says blocked output so I can visually see on my chart when the signal blocker node is actively blocking signals so what I did is I put a point one here point one and so now I can see see my bloodhound output let me um, I'm going to change the scaling on on Bloodhound here. Oops, didn't mean to do that. All right, so I set Bloodhound to a, a fixed scaling so we can see the 1 and the negative 1 both at the same time. And so you can see that here when this long signal occurs, it's you can see this point 0.1 output here. So you can see it's blocking all the long outputs until we get to our next short signal. And now this short signal goes through, and you can see it's no longer blocking the long signals anymore, right? But it is blocking the short signals. So you can see that little point 0.1 output on the short side but you can see the little point 0.1 value on the long side is gone, so it's not blocking long signals anymore. And so as it's blocking our short signals, right, it blocked the secondary short signal here that we didn't want, and it continues on blocking until our next long signal pops up. And now you can see it's no longer blocking the short signals anymore but instead it is blocking the long signals as they come through. All right, so you can just see that the signal blockers is flip-flopping back and forth, blocking, you know, blocking the secondary signals that are that 
that could come in. So essentially, that is it. It was um, that simple to do. So that was a, a good question there from Jennifer. So, all right, I see a couple of comments came in here. Um, so Julie is asking, go back, how did you connect those? All right, let me, let me put this on full screen here and zoom on in. So I, you know, I don't think I've ever really kind of talked about how our, how our connector leaders work. So for example, you can only have one leader connected in to any, you know, connection point. So if I take this solver here and I drag a leader over to the result node, right, it's going to automatically disconnect that previous leader because you can only have one, um, one connection into this guy at one time. So I can take this OR node, drag it in, and it disconnected that guy. So um, let's connect this guy back up. You know, but these logic nodes are a little different, right? If I grab a leader, you know, it's just going to keep allowing you to keep adding as many solvers into this OR node, you know, as you want. And it's just going to keep popping up with a new new connection there. So let me disconnect that. Um, and so like with um, these function nodes, you can only have one leader connected in at a time, but they do not automatically disconnect. Right? You can see it's automatically attaching the leader to the reset because the input connector is already filled. It's already got one and I can't force this leader into it in this case. Um, so the result node is the only one where you automatically where it automatically disconnects the other leader for you. So if I wanted to change what's going into this signal blocker, you know, I have to manually disconnect that and then I could take my OR node and choose which one I want to connect it into, like that. So I think probably what Julie was referring to is when, is when I first added these crossover solvers, um, I'm guessing, I kind of did it really quickly. I just dropped the OR node on in there and I just want to connect, connect, and connect, and I just connected them up real quick. So kind of what I did is um, I'll disconnect all these guys. So what I did real quick in the beginning is I just connected this in, and I connected that in, and connected that in. I did it really quick. I know that there, you know, when you're watching webinars that you don't see all the frame rates, so probably you miss a few things. So that's all I did real quick like that. So, and then I connect this guy up to the AND node, connect this OR node back up like that. Let me move this guy off to the side. And then connect the AND node to the input and then output out to the result node. And our system should be working again. There we go. Yep. Okay, let's see. Let's see what Robert is asking. Instead of using opposite signal, let's change the rules to make the MACD only drop uh, only drop below zero uh, to be reset. So we can have two longs without a short in between. Okay, yeah, that's a good little little twist on that. Um, so let me zoom out. So here's another functionality of our logic board here is uh, my mouse has a scroll wheel on it. So I'm using my scroll wheel to zoom in and out. So and also 
my mouse button, the scroll wheel, I can press on my scroll wheel and it acts as a third mouse button. And so when I do that, I can also pan around by holding down my scroll wheel or basically I'm holding down the third mouse button and I can pan around. But if your mouse doesn't have that, there's the button up here, the pan button up there, right? And it stays in pan mode until you turn, go back up here and turn it back off. So you can see it's turned on right now. You see how it has an outline? It has this bluish outline around it. So that means you're in pan mode and of course your mouse, the the mouse cursor looks like a hand, so I'll turn it off, and now I get a regular mouse, a regular mouse icon. All right, so Matt wants to add, change the rules a bit. So let's see if we can find, let's see if we can find a spot here that meets uh, Robert's rules here. So I'm just going to scroll through the chart real quick and. Ah, here we go. So right here, we can see the MACD crosses below the zero line. It kind of floats around in the zero line. Is look at all this consolidation and price action here, and then goes back up above our uh, 0.02. So, um, and so, yep. So we get a little, little uh, trend up for again. Okay, so so right now, you know this this signal blocker, right? It's just using the the input signals, right? So it's using the signals coming from the and and node, right? Which is our which is at our point zero two thresholds. So what we need to do is we need to create a new solver that um, that has a zero, that has the zero line as our threshold level to reset our signal blocker. So let's create that. So I'm just going to drop a new, um, let's see. Yeah, I think I'll cr drop a new crossover solver on here. And let me change the name on here. So all right, zero line. Let's change this over to the MACD. Okay, just gonna use the default. I have to use the same, right, the same periods as the other MACD and in these other solvers over here. And so next I'll change indicator B to the absolute zero absolute value of zero. Uh, and so now we can see we got all these signals coming in every time the MACD crosses that zero line. So this node or this solver is going to be used to reset the signal blocker here. So I don't want to use this input. I don't want to use the input connection anymore. So I'm going to turn that off. So now what I'm going to use is the reset connection. Let me zoom in here so you can actually read that. Alright, so I'm going to use the reset connection now instead and let me put it back on the signal blocker so I want a reset opposite signal so where is that guy here we go reset opposite signal so I need to set that to true and I need to connect this up All right, let me shrink the chart up a little bit there. And um, 
Oh, hold on. Okay, so it's a good thing I had the uh, the blocked output still turned on, so I can see my when I got the short signal here. Um, all right, so when I got the short signal here, I can see if I look at the output, I'm still my long signals are still getting blocked, even when we crossed above um, the positive 0 0.02 level. So I actually made a mistake. I do need to keep this input opposite signal still turned on. There we go. So now so we can see so we so now we got our long signal back and we can see that the signal blocker is blocking our long signals and then it stops. And where did it stop? It stopped right here when the MACD crossed below that zero level. So we can see our our new requirement of crossing below the zero line to get another long signal is working because the signal blocker is no longer blocking any signals anymore. And there we go. Now we got our secondary um, we got our secondary long signal back. Um, and look, it's still blocked this secondary short signal. Still blocked it because the MACD did not cross above the zero line yet. So there we go. So whatever your criteria is, you know, to allow a second, like, so in this example, you know, right here, so we got our first long signal, you know, so whatever your criteria is, you know, to allow these second, secondary signals in the same direction, so if you have different criteria to allow a signal in the second, sec, a secondary signal in the same direction, <laughs> that's a tongue twister. Um, so if you have a different criteria for that, that is what this reset connection is for. So you can, um, you know, so you can make a solver with, you know, whatever your conditions might be, and you just plug it into this reset, and that allows you to create a different set of conditions, you know, right, to turn the signal blocker off. So essentially, another way of rephrasing this reset section here is, you know, all of these settings here essentially just turn the signal blocker off, um, right? So we can see by Bloodhound's output here, you know, that what it's doing is this cross below the zero line. All it did was it just turned the signal blocker node off, so it's no longer blocking. Right, so that's what these resets are, is they're resetting the node and turning it off. All right, so I think that takes care of Robert's question there. Um, so, cool, all right, so Julie's got a question here. Can you show us the histogram slope in MACD? Uh, you bet. So I already have the MACD on here. So let me turn the histogram uh, plot on. As I start, turned it off, set it to transparent. So how about if I, I don't know, put it on gray. How does that work? Yeah, there we go. That gray works pretty good, I think. So let me open up Bloodhound. And so let's, um, I'll disconnect that and just leave it in its default state. And for Julie's question, I'm going to make a, a new, new logic board here. And let's call this the MACD 
slope. So let me throw a slope solver on here and I'll zoom in so you can see it a little better. All right, and connect it up. So the first thing I'll need to do is change my indicator, switch it over to the MACD, and we want the histogram, which NinjaTrader calls it the diff, or it's the difference. So the histogram is a simple um, subtraction formula. So if you take the MACD and subtract the average line from the MACD, what you end up with is the difference. So the histogram is just the difference or the delta between the MACD and the average. So let's uh, select that and we're done. Um, I should name this MACD hist, histogram slope. Um, yeah, so there we go. So there's the slope of it. So you'll notice um, that even when the histogram is in the positive area, that when it's sloping down, well, it's, it is sloping down even though it's in the positive side of the zero line. We're still going to get a short output because it's just purely looking at the slope of the histogram here. All right, and let's see. Well, it looks like John has a question, but unfortunately he had to go. Um, oh, no question. It, uh, let's see, it's dinner time for John, so he must be over in Australia. All right, well, okay, so that's it. Um, I got through the questions, and um, let's see. I, I have some time, so let me kind of just, let me bring up Raven here and talk about it just real quickly. Um, all right, let's see, let me let's close up uh, Bloodhound's interface. And let me kind of put my chart back to normal. Minimize that guy. All right, I need to bring up my control panel because I'm not connected to my data feed, so let me connect up here. And then I can put a strategy on my chart. All right, good. Good to go. Um, let's see, I'm going to switch my Bloodhound back over to that MACD system. There we go. All right, so let's add a strategy. Let's add a Raven on here so I can show you guys a couple of things. So add that on. And I'll load in today's uh, template. There we go. And so here's something I always like to do. Um, right, so remember, this is the interface. This is the Bloodhound interface coming from Raven. So I like to switch over to my Logic tab and just take a quick peek at, you know, the Logic template that I, that I want to run. Because the things I like to check for is, you know, see, like I forgot to disconnect this guy. Um, you know, or if I was working with Bloodhound on my chart and I left the interface open, um, you know, or the last time I might have saved, the last time I might have saved this file, I might have fought, forgotten to disconnect this leader, you know, so I always like to take a look um, at the logic template and make sure all my leaders at least look correct. So I know this guy is disconnected and that's good. So now, now that I'm satisfied that, you know, all my leader connections look correct and everything, um, you know, I might even want to take a quick look at at uh, the signal blocker, see how it's set up, and, um, and I'm sure it's fine. Yeah, 200 bars, true and true. 
Yeah, looks real good. Just take a quick look at it. And <clears throat> I'm going to set my entry logic to the entries. Um, okay, so here, here is from the interface point of view, here's a change um, that's been made. So this now says back test mode. So what happened was, um, Jeremy can probably give a better explanation, but essentially what, what's happening now is um, we're not able to show historical trades and live trades at the same time. Um, there's just something that we're having to overcome with NinjaTrader to try and get both historical and live trades working correctly. There's a little technical glitch um, and because we didn't want traders running into that uh, if they were trading live money, we basically had to come up with a temporary solution while we find a better solution. And so now this back test mode, um, if, if I set it to true, it's going to show you historical trades, but it will not take live trades. All right, so if you're interested in um, forward testing on live data market, then you'll have to take this and put it on false. So you, so you want to turn the back test mode off by putting it on false, and then Raven will trade in uh, on live incoming data. So let's set, set that to false. Um, and so everything else is, is the same. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy added, I think, a few more of these NinjaTrader parameters, right? These are NinjaTrader controlled parameters. So he threw a couple more. I think he added a couple of these in here. And I think um, he'll add some more as time goes by. But we really wanted to push out this new um, version of Raven that fixes a lot of the uh, back-end issues. So you don't really see any changes to the front end. So the front end is basically this interface. The back end is, uh, is what's the, the code, the programming code that you don't see. Um, so let's see. That, um, how about if I put a simple target in there? Turn it on, so that way we can see the interface. And you'll also notice, really, the interface didn't change either. Either, so this update really fixes um, problems in in inside the code that we were experiencing. So now that we've got that update and that out, um, so you can um, use Ninja use Raven a little more reliably. Right, Raven is a lot more robust. I haven't been able to get it to crash yet. Um, so it's definitely a lot more solid than it used to be. And now, um, as I said earlier, once Jeremy kind of gets the um, a couple of other small projects done, you know, he wants to license the back rank, back test Ranko, then he's going to work on um, improving, um, adding more features to the interface. And I think he's going to add more, um, I think he's going to add a couple more couple more things um, to this interface as well. So. All right. Well, that does it, guys.